prophet in ancient Israel during the time of the first half of the Bible, the Old Testament, it was no fun. Like no ancient Israelite king, kid would say to themselves, I think I wanna be a prophet when I grow up. Being a prophet meant things like wandering around, seemingly purposeless. Like I, I personally try not to use words like crazy and lunatic flippantly, but in this case, being a prophet meant that people assumed you were one of those things. Take John the Baptist, for instance. He was a prophet and a contemporary of Jesus. He wore clothes made out of camel hair and ate locusts. Being a prophet meant being misunderstood and called a killjoy. You had to say things that people really didn't want to hear, and that meant constantly second-guessing yourself. Prophets, they were meant to be spokespeople for God, and so they often said things that God's people didn't want to hear. So I would just like imagine they would question themselves, like, did God really say that? Or, God, are you sure you want me to say that? Isn't there another way that we could word things? This week, we're continuing the series we started last week called Meeting God in Dark Spaces. It's based on a series from Grace Church and a book called Everybody Does Some Cave Time by George Acevedo. We're talking about the different dark spaces we all sometimes find ourselves in. Caves of anger, depression, grief, etc. And today we're going to discuss depression. And we're going to use the story of the prophet Elijah to discuss depression and, and some things that helped him come out of that dark space. Elijah, who was one of the most famous prophets recorded about in scripture, lived during a time in Israel's history when it must have just felt like the wheels were just coming off the bus. Israel was ruled by an evil king named Ahab, who was married to a Canaanite woman named Jezebel, who was even worse. As an aside, this Jezebel was legitimately evil, but her name and her legacy has been twisted, especially within the church, to accuse women of shamelessness and to belittle women who challenge the status quo, actually to silence women who might be prophetic in the church. This usage of the name Jezebel is disconnected from the actual story of this woman. Okay, back to our regularly scheduled program. When Ahab and Jezebel were in power, the Israelites turned away from Yahweh, from the God of Israel, to start worshiping the pagan god Baal and a goddess named Asherah. One day, God sent the prophet Elijah to confront the evil king Ahab with this message. As surely as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, the God I serve, there will be no dew or rain for the next few years until I give the word. You can imagine that this did not make King Ahab or Queen Jezebel very happy. And when Jezebel became upset, she did her best to exert control in extreme ways. She was livid and looking for someone to take this out on. This is why Elijah immediately hears God giving him a second command. Get out of there. And Elijah spends the next three years in hiding until God sends him back to the king with a proposal for a winner-takes-all challenge. Now summon all Israel to join me at Mount Carmel, along with the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah, who are supported by Jezebel. Now bring two bulls. The prophets of Baal may choose whichever one they wish and cut it into pieces and lay it on all on the wood of their altar, but without setting fire to it. I'll prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood on the altar, but not set fire to it. Then call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by setting fire to the wood is the true God, and all the people agreed. So thousands of Israelites assembled on the Carmel mountain range to watch the show. The prophets of Baal won the coin toss and moved first, so Elijah's turn comes at the second half. They started praying and dancing and singing, and nothing happens. Baal and Asherah don't respond to the cries of the people. And at some point in this, Elijah starts to trash talk. He starts mocking them. You'll have to shout louder, for surely he is a god. Perhaps he's daydreaming or is relieving himself. Or maybe he's away on a trip or is asleep and he just needs to be wakened. Don't let anyone tell you there's not poop jokes in the Bible. So now it's Elijah's turn. The prophets of Baal and Asherah were unsuccessful. And when Elijah steps up to the plate, he does something strange. He has them soak everything in water. 
the altar, the ox meat, even the firewood. Have you ever tried to start a fire with wet or damp firewood? It's like impossible. Then Elijah prays to Yahweh, and fire immediately falls from heaven and burns up the offering. All the people saw it happen and fell to their faces in worship, exclaiming, God is the true God. God is the true God. It's quite a story. And that's where it typically ends. At least that's what typically where it ends when we tell it from our children's storybook Bibles. Now, one of the ways that we process our messages here at Sycamore Creek Church is that we'll pause a few times to chat. So here's our first chat question. Have you ever heard this story before? And what do you feel as you hear it recounted? Now, the next part of the story is pretty gruesome. Elijah instructs the people to seize all the prophets of Baal and Asherah and kill them. Maybe Elijah should join us next week when we talk about anger. And then the real miracle happens. Elijah prays for rain. And after three years of drought, the rain comes pouring down. Elijah, the hunted and hated prophet, has now become the hero whom God has used to save those people. First, he defeated 950 false prophets. Then he led Israel to repentance and now managed to call both fire and rain down from heaven. Not too shabby. Oh, this is where someone says to Elijah, now that you've won the Super Bowl of prophets, where are you going? And he turns to the camera, he's like, I'm going to Disney World, right? He does a victory lap and then he goes and continues celebrating with his closest friends. Not exactly. Let's turn to the next chapter of the story together. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and he fell asleep. Wow, what happened? Elijah was a hero. He he just went from a literal and figurative mountaintop moment to hiding under a broom bush, scared, exhausted, and in despair. He prays to die. I think it's safe to use the word depressed to describe him at this moment. He lets his fear and exhaustion drive him into suffering, and ultimately, it takes him all the way to a literal dark place. There, he went into the cave and spent the night. Last week, we heard about the cave of resurrection and how the worst thing is never the last thing. We learn to look for the light in the darkness. Remember the truth that we've learned. A cave can either be a hiding place or a holy place. A cave can be a place where we escape to hide from the world, numbing ourselves, ignoring the problems we have. Or it can be a safe haven to encounter God and experience transformation. Elijah's story gives us hope. When we find ourselves asking this question, how do I make it out of the cave of depression? Now, we're calling Elijah's story the cave of depression, but I want to be careful with that term and offer some clarity. When I say depression in this message, I'm not intending to talk about the clinical form of depression, the mental and emotional condition that requires medical treatment and therapy to address its underlying underlying causes, which include things like brain chemistry and our DNA. I'm also not intending to communicate that there is a spiritual way to bypass medically necessary medication or therapy. As someone who takes medication for depression and anxiety and has been in therapy, I want to encourage any of you who are struggling under a weight that you just can't get out from under please send an email or call our counselor to get on her wait list or go to psychologytoday.com to find a provider that might be a good fit for you. Today, we're talking about the cave of depression that all of us are familiar with. It's that place of discouragement, sadness, and dark thoughts. It's Elijah feeling the broom bush blues. Have you ever been there? 
I expect that if you had never been there before, you have found yourself in this cave sometime in the past three years. I remember feeling so overwhelmed in March of 2020, trying so hard to focus on the positives, like extra family time, but being so overwhelmed, finishing my classes, working part-time, and then suddenly also homeschooling my kids. My seminary graduation moved online and my job search was paused. I had just started to let myself hope for what things would be like when we moved after I graduated. I just felt sucked back, like I would never be able to break free. Everybody does some cave time. Everyone finds themselves in dark spaces. In fact, it's not just Elijah who experiences this in the Bible. There's a whole bunch of other folks. It's Moses, after he has led the Israelites out of enslavement in Egypt, asking God to kill him. It's Naomi, after her two sons had died, changing her name to Mara, which means bitter. It's David, after being hunted by King Saul and hiding in a cave in despair. It's Mary of Bethany, reminding Jesus her brother wouldn't have died if he had been there. It's Peter, after he denied Jesus three times, weeping bitterly. And it's even Jesus himself, after the Last Supper, saying in the Garden of Gethsemane that his soul was being crushed to the point of death. So how do you respond to the idea that so many heroes of the Bible struggled with deep sadness and depression? Let's take a minute and talk about it. is true. We all do some cave time. Just like Elijah, we find ourselves headed to the cave of depression not long after the rush of an adrenaline-fueled high. The Gospels tell us about Jesus being baptized in the Jordan River, and it's amazing, complete with doves and a voice from heaven. And guess what happens immediately after that spiritual high? Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted and became very hungry. During that time, the devil came and talked to him, said to him. So the devil goes talking to Jesus to try to tempt him, to try to disrupt his purpose on earth. Apparently, the devil knows when we're at our most vulnerable, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. It's right after that spiritual high. It's no mistake that this message is coming the week after Easter. Don't you feel sometimes like after big religious holidays with lots of hype that you can just feel deflated afterward? Maybe you're struggling with that feeling right now. Life can take us right up to the cave of depression, but our adversary will also do everything he can to keep us there. The good news is that we don't have to stay there. Jesus was able to resist the temptation to be distracted from his purpose. Elijah needed a little bit more hands-on help, a hands-on support from God in his journey. I want to make it really clear that even though the things I'm about to share are simple, they are not always easy. When you're in this cave, when you're living under the weight of deep sadness and melancholy, it's difficult to do these things. Listen to the first way that God prompts Elijah to make it through his cave of depression. All at once, an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. So the first thing I need to do if I'm in the cave of depression and I want to make this a holy place instead of a hiding place is restore my rhythms. Elijah takes a nap, eats some food, and drinks water. The angel tells him to eat a snack twice. It's simple, but not necessarily easy. Like, I can't decide if I love this. Like, yes, taking a nap and eating snack is my answer to most problems that I face. Resist the capitalist demand for production. Rest! Or if I hate this, like, my problems are too complicated for this and fixing a snack is sometimes too overwhelming. Notice that neither God nor the angel tell Elijah to snap out of it. It's a terrible and unhelpful thing to say to someone who is experiencing depression. They didn't tell Elijah, don't worry, be happy. Bypassing our emotions is a quick way to cut ourselves off from joy. They didn't tell Elijah, if you were a good prophet, if you actually trusted God, you wouldn't feel this way. 
God prompts Elijah to recover healthy rhythms in the midst of his discouragement. God focuses on the bottom tier of the hierarchy of needs first. It wouldn't be helpful to start any higher on that list. Get up and eat. It doesn't have to be fancy unless cooking fancy food is restorative for you and you have the energy. But you might read a book. Wake up in the morning and go for a walk. Go to work, come to church, pray. If it's too hard to pray, then tell that to God. Like, dear God, it's too hard to pray right now. Please help me. Bless someone who's not expecting it. Serve someone in need. Elijah's first step was literally taking the first step to get up and eat. And depending on where you at, you're at, you may need to start very small, and that's okay. Be so gentle with yourself, but start somewhere. We need to restore our rhythms when the cave makes us want to quit. God leads you and I to do something else in the cave of depression. Reclaim my identity. After Elijah gets up and eats, he runs off and hides in a cave on Mount Horeb. But God isn't finished with their conversation. He asks Elijah a question. What are you doing here, Elijah? I hear so much tenderness in God's voice there. Like maybe a little frustration, but not a lot. Like when I stumble into a room and find that one of my kids has been playing in a way that has made a huge mess, but I can remember that they're just seeking to meet an internal need. And so I just ask, what are you doing here? And here's how Elijah responds. I've zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Notice that he doesn't really answer the question. It's a non-answer. Elijah is so focused on what he's doing, he's forgotten who he is. So God tells Elijah to go out and stand on the mountain. God is drawing him out of the darkness of the cave into the light of God's presence. Listen to what happens next. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast, the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. God doesn't appear to be interested in Elijah's spiritual resume. Rather, God is helping Elijah reclaim his identity as a child of God and a person of worth. It's not about the powerful adrenaline-fueled moments like the windstorm and the fire and the earthquake. God's presence is in the gentle whisper. The Hebrew there literally translates the word to silence. God is found in the sheer silence that's all around us all the time. Even in our cave of depression, God is there in the silence, constantly drawing our attention to the light. In verse 13, God asks a second time, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah gives the same answer. I've served you zealously. Everyone hates me. I'm all alone. He still doesn't really get it. But now that Elijah has restored some of his rhythms and stood close to the edge of the cave, God can pierce through his dark depression with the truth. Yeah, I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. Elijah's cave had convinced him that he was the only one, that things would never get better, that he would always feel this way. Underneath his depression was fear and despair, but none of that was true. There were, in fact, thousands of his brothers and sisters ready to stand with him and move forward. To make it through the cave of depression, we not only must reclaim our identity as children of God, we must also reclaim the family, the community to which we belong. Jesus died to give birth to this family. So don't let the cave cut you off from that community. God says to Elijah and to you and to me, I am with you. You are not alone. So let's take a minute and talk about it. How have you restored your rhythms or reclaimed your identity in the past? Now, maybe you've never struggled to leave this particular cave, but maybe someone close to you has had a hard time. Maybe your spouse has been in the cave of depression. Maybe it was a parent. 
maybe it was your child. If you or someone you know is in this cave and unable to restore rhythms and reclaim identity, or if restoring rhythms and reclaiming identity doesn't appear to be helping with the feelings you're having, that's probably a good time for you to have a conversation with your doctor or your therapist. We live in a society with a great deal of emphasis on personal responsibility and motivation, which means that we often internalize the belief that we ought to just pull ourselves right out of this cave. And if the cave is on the melancholy side of things, you might be able to do that. If the cave is in the clinical depression realm, there's an excellent chance that won't be possible. And you know what? There is no moral weight to which side of the cave you're in. You're not more spiritual if you're experiencing melancholy as opposed to clinical depression. The invitation today is for you to take the steps that you can. Restore the rhythms that you can in the ways that you can. Reclaim your identity, or if you lose sight of that for a time, allow your community to carry you. The important thing is for you to remember your identity. You're a child of God and a person of worth. You might be a person who has a friend or someone you love who's in the cave. Or you might be hiding under the broom bush with Elijah stuck in the cave of depression. I believe God can transform our hiding place into a holy place. When you're in the cave of depression or when someone you love is there, God is present with you, shaping and guiding and prompting you to restore your rhythms and reclaim your identity. Here is God's invitation to you today. Even in the darkness, look for the light. Take care of yourself with food and rest. Remember that you are a child of God and a person of worth.